Thank you so much, everyone, for your participation this morning. Thank you, Sister Woods. Thank you, Daryl. And thank you, Sister Renty, for those selections. Thank you, Brother Turner, for the prayer, Minister Eskridge, for the reading. And thank you, Reverend Lewis, for conducting this morning. We certainly hope that everyone is doing well. And, oh, yes, I want to thank the deacons also for the devotion. We hope that everyone this morning is doing well. And uh, we know that you are doing relatively well because the Lord, by his grace, woke you up this morning and allowed you to see another day along with me. And so we're here this morning to look now into his word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we come this morning, we come in the name of Jesus to thank you once again for another privilege and for another opportunity. As we come this morning to look to you, we ask you to please to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. We just ask that you would give us insight that we can see further, Lord, and then to lift out that which you would have us to know, to feed these, thy people, that they might be edified, master, if there's anyone on today that does not know Jesus and a part of their sin, <clears throat> a word that um, the Holy Spirit might use to convict and draw them before it's everlasting too late. Again, we ask you to please forgive us of all of our sins. Open down my, now my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask it. Amen. <clears throat> this morning... Um, We'd like for you to um, be noted or drawn to a couple of scriptures. Uh, one of those is in Luke chapter 2, verse 7. The other one is in Revelations chapter 1, verse 7. And we're just going to read these two passages. These two passages are really to give support to the subject itself. Uh, most of us are pretty much familiar with what these two passages themselves represent, and particularly in Luke, since we're in the Christmas season. But Luke chapter 2, verse 7 says, And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Revelations chapter 1, verse 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so Amen. I want you to think this morning about the advents of Christ. The advents of Christ. These two verses present to us the two advents of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, in Luke chapter 2 that we just read, it deals with his first advent. In other words, the time that he came to earth. In Revelation chapter uh, 1, it identifies the second, uh, for which, again, will come to earth. The advent of something means that uh, whatever it is that we're looking for is finally here. It means that we have been looking with some great anticipation. And sometimes when we're thinking, when we're thinking in terms of looking with great anticipation, uh, there's all kinds of things around us for which we can identify in that particular way. You might be looking for... Uh, um, uh, a new house. You might be looking for a new job. You might be looking for uh, to, to establish a new relationship or a renewed relationship with someone you haven't seen for a while and plans have been set and you're looking forward to that day getting closer and closer. We are in right now what is considered the Advent season because this is the season of the Lord's first Advent. Uh, we're preparing and have been preparing for Christmas to celebrate his birth. Uh, it's a time when uh, believers are looking expectantly and preparing. And really, for we as believers, this season ought to be centered around two categories. Not only are we looking to celebrate the time when he came the first time, but it's also a time to remind him, remind ourselves that since he came the first time, he's also going to come again, which means that we need to be preparing ourselves for his second coming. Advent means coming. Matter of fact, that the Sundays leading up to Christmas itself are, are, are in this Advent season are each identified with joy and love, and I would add to that peace as we move toward that time of celebration 
of the Lord's birth here on earth. A celebration of Advent is possible only to those, and listen to me now, the real celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in their soul, who know themselves to be poor and imperfect, who look forward to something greater to come. Now, that's a true, that's a true statement. I read that uh, someplace, and, that, and that's a true statement. Troubled in soul. Those who are troubled in soul and those within themselves know that they are poor and, and imperfect, and they're looking forward to something greater. The fact of the matter is, brothers and sisters, there's, as I said, there's truth wrapped up in this statement because you, you can't really celebrate something you're disconnected from. We can't celebrate something that we've really had no involvement in. In other words, let me give an example. The 4th of July, this nation celebrates its independence. But while this nation as a whole celebrates its independence and while we as African Americans are part of this country, the 4th of July does not carry the same meaning for us that it does for other people in this nation. Yes, we, we get our fireworks, and yes, we, we, we go to places where there's big events and there's big displays, and yes, we spend our money just like everybody else. But the fact of the matter is, is we cannot identify it in this, with it in the same way as others who are, who are doing so because our, our relationship with it is disconnected. Pretty soon here at the end of this month, uh, we will be having what's called a watch service. And if you know the thing about our watch service, it's the time when our foreparents had received the information about the Emancipation Proclamation and, and the hour, the, 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 there was an anxious anticipating, waiting for uh, midnight because come January 1, they would mark the time of freedom. There was an anxious anticipation moving to hoard that, and it was celebrated even to this day and time, which we now call watch service. To be disconnected from the real purpose means that whatever it is that we're celebrating, we're just going through the motions because we really have no connection. In other words, some we can join in, or there are some who can join in and just make a lot of noise, but the problem is, is when they investigate themselves, they personally have nothing to make noise about. In other words, they don't have any real experience. They don't have any real testimony. They don't have anything to share. They're just joining in with the party. And when it comes to this matter of the Advent season, unfortunately, there's a whole lot of people caught up in this same type scenario, in this same type situation. There are some who are able to celebrate the Advent season because they recognize that it marks the coming of our Lord born into this world to save the world from its sins. We recognize what this is all about. Jesus is the reason for the season it's not supposed to be just a cliche for the believer. It's supposed to be a testimony. It's supposed to be that during this time, yes, we might spend our money, and yes, we might exchange gifts, but during this season, we ought to be telling somebody about Jesus. We ought to be telling somebody about what the season is really all about. And because we've been born again and have a relationship with him, then that means then that now we can look forward. We look forward with hope. We look forward with anticipation for the second advent. The Apostle Paul demonstrated uh, this type of spirit that I'm talking about. In other words, someone who is uh, uh, poor in spirit, someone who is imperfect and looking for something greater. He identified, he identified himself in this particular way in Romans chapter 7, verses 18 and verse 24. Verse 18, he says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. In this same chapter, Paul says this. He says, every time I desire to do good, evil is present with me. Verse 24, he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? In other words, Paul recognized that he was imperfect. He realized that there was still a struggle going on between the flesh and the spirit. He was redeemed, but he recognized that there was a war going on. He recognized that, that he was not satisfied, that he was not what he wanted to be. 
And if you and I are honest with ourselves, you and I, as we sit here today, have to recognize that we're not what we should be. We're, we're, we're not to the strength that we ought to have. We're not walking the way that we should. And, and part of the problem for that is because we're still wrestling with this old self. This old self still elevates his head to try to throw us off the pack, path. And as a result of that, we ought to be deep down in our hearts, deep down in our spirit, in our soul, in our mind. We ought to be yearning because we want to be free. We, we want to be set free free from this struggle. We don't want to be wrestling with negativity. We don't want to be wrestling with, with trials and tribulations. We certainly don't want to be constantly wrestling uh, with sin. So we're looking for something greater, but that something greater can only be experienced when the advent or the second advent of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, come. Paul goes on to put it another way. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, he says "For this, if this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, we know that we have another building, eternal in the heavens, not made by hands. That's looking forward to something greater. But then he says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 23, he says, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart, but to be with Christ, uh, to be with Christ uh, which is far better. In other words, he was struggling on the inside. He knew that there was something better than what he was going through. He knew that there was a better place. He knew that to be in the literal presence of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that that was far better than being locked up in prison here on earth, than being shackled to soldiers here on earth, to, to have um, people around you that are smiling on one side, but in essence having a knife in your back and the other because they're jealous of who you are or jealous of the gift and the power that God has given. He recognized that struggle. He wanted to leave but he let the church know that it's needful for me to be here for you because as long as the Lord leaves me here with you, I'm able to testify. I'm able to pre preach his word. I'm able to build you up. But if by my personal desire, which is really what this is all about, he said, I have a desire to be with Christ. He's looking for something better. In other words, because Jesus came the first time, he says, I'm aware that there's something better, and I'm looking for it, and I'm looking for it right now. And, and I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but when I look at myself, I can't speak for you. I can only speak for myself. When I look at myself, I find myself getting tired of the struggle. I find myself getting tired of the struggle of fighting, of sin, of the negativity, of all the other things going on. I get tired of falling. I get tired of stumbling. I get tired of having to get up in it because I know that there's something better than this, something that doesn't keep you crying all the time, something that doesn't keep you worrying all the time. But, but this, this is a part of the struggle. This is a part of moving forward. This is a part of looking forward to that great and anxious day. Somebody said we can't appreciate heaven unless we've had a little bit of hell. Well, no, living here on earth is not hell, but it's hell enough to make us appreciate heaven for what it is. Somebody said there's got to be rain in your life in order to appreciate the sunshine. So the second advent, the second time that Jesus is coming, is something that we as believers are supposed to be looking forward to. But let me just give you a, a, a quick three, uh, three points here, and then we'll try to be out of the way. So the first point is this, because the scripture identifies for us the predictions of his advent. The predictions of his advent. In other words, in Genesis chapter 15, uh, the, this is the first verse in scripture that, that foretells, that predicts, that prophesies, if you will, about the first advent of the coming of Jesus Christ. You know what's going on here. Adam and Eve had sinned and violated God's order in the garden. And when the Lord shows up to confront them and to talk with them about it, he also ends up having to confront Satan because Satan is the one who deceived Eve, and Adam is the one who yielded to Satan, even though he knew what God had said. And so in verse 15 of Genesis chapter 3, this is what the Lord says. The Lord said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between her seed, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Well, the seed of the woman that, that is being prophesied here is Jesus Christ himself. He's telling Satan, Satan, your time is coming, and my son is going to bruise his heel, bruise your head, and because he's bruising your head, he's going to bruise his heel. But this is the foretelling of the advent of the coming of Jesus Christ. The prophet Micah picks it up in, verse, in chapter 5, verse 2, when he says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, 
thou that uh, be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me. That is uh, the ruler um, in Israel, whose going forth have been from old and from everlasting. That's talking about the first advent of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The, the prophet Isaiah puts it this way. He says in, in chapter 9, he says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Pr Prince of Peace. Isaiah is talking about the advent, the first advent, and, and really to tell you the truth, uh, what's wrapped up in his verse is not just the first advent, but also the second advent of the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But then here are a couple of verses that speak about the second advent of him coming. We find this in Genesis 2, Genesis as well. Genesis 49, verse 10. Moses writing and said, The sepulcher shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall gather uh, shall, shall be the gathering of all of the people. Well, who is Shiloh? This is a reference to the Messiah. This is a reference to the coming of Jesus Christ. But to the gathering of all the people that this scripture is talking about is speaking um, more, more toward the millennial period than his first advent. Because remember that when he came to Israel, when he came to to, 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 to Judea, when he came to the people, there were many who did not want to accept him. Remember what John wrote in, in the first uh, chapter of, of, of John, when he said he came unto his own, but his own received him not. But here in Genesis, where Moses is writing and talking about um, uh, the sepulcher shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, now he's talking about the Messiah coming, and when the people are gathered, it's not just Israel, it's all the people of the earth, it's all the people of the world. In other words, so this is speaking more of the millennial kingdom where Jesus will rule on this earth for a thousand years, which deals with his second advent. Isaiah picks it up in, sec in chapter 2 and verse 4 when he says, And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. This is during the tribul this is during the millennial period, which follows the tribulation period, when there will be one thousand years of peace up on this earth, because Jesus will have come on this earth for the second time, and he will bring absolute total peace on this earth at this time, and this is what Isaiah is prophesying to about the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then while we won't turn to it and read it, but you can read it for yourself, we read Revelation chapter 19 and Revelation chapter 20 that also outlines and identifies for us uh, the millennial reign and, and the millennial setting for the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, point number two, the fulfillments of his advent. The fulfillments of his advent. Well, the first advent is his birth, which we've already seen in Luke chapter 2. But let's take a look at it again. At again. It says, and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. This is his first time showing up on earth. What did he do when he came to earth? He gave sight to the blind. He, he, he unstopped tongues. He opened ears so that those who could not hear uh, could hear. He opened eyes so that they could see. He raised the dead. He fed 5,000. He walked on the water. Uh, uh, he, he, he spoke to the winds and the storms, and they all behaved themselves. In other words, he presented to us the Father and the Father's will. He said, I did not come to do my own will, but I came to do the will of him that sent me. He said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Since he came the first time, sh uh, shall there not be, uh, there should not be any doubt, church, that he is coming again. Well, the second advent is his, is, is the second, is his uh, second return. John says it in Revelation chapter 1, um, verse 7, when he says, Behold, he cometh in the clouds, and every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him, shall see him when he comes, and all the nations, all the people of the earth 
are going to wail because of his coming. In other words, they weren't looking for him. In other words, their minds weren't set. They thought everything was all right. They think that they've got everything together. They think that they've got their life ordered exactly how they want it. But don't you remember what the Lord says? He says, as they were in the day of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man comes. In other words, they're going to be getting married. They're going to be having their parties. They're going to be having their concerts. They're going to be doing their shopping. They're going to be going about their daily business. They're going to be going to work. They're going to be planning for this, that, and the other. When all of a sudden, sudden destruction is going to come. What, what John is describing in Revelation chapter 1, he says, Behold, he cometh in the clouds. But what John shows us in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 14, it shows us what Jesus looks like when he's coming in these clouds. Verse 11 says, And, I, and I, he says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. When he comes, church is going to be coming, riding a white horse. He says, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that set upon him is called faithful and true, and um, in righteousness he doeth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now, I want you to see something here in verse 13. John doesn't say his name was called the Word of God. He says he, says he has a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. In other words, he's alive and well. In other words, he's on his way back. In other words, he's not a used to be. He, he's, he still is. He, he, he is the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him with white horses clothed in fine linen and, and uh, that were white and clean. It, this, this, this passage takes me back to when I was um, a, a boy growing up and my mother and, and, and grandmother used to take us to Versailles to visit my great-grandmother that lived in Versailles. And my great-grandmother and great-grandfather lived over on a far hill uh, just outside of the town of Versailles itself. And one, one summer afternoon, uh, uh, I was sitting out in the front yard of my great-grandmother, and she had a, she had a hickory nut tree uh, there right in the front yard. And I was sitting underneath that tree, and Mother came out, as she often did sometimes, and, and, and would share, um, uh, sing some songs with us and tell us some stories uh, about Jesus. And she opened up the Bible and was telling, me, telling us one time, that Jesus was going to come back one of these days. And when she got done and left and went back into the house, I didn't realize that she was looking for me, but the impact of the story that she told me that he's coming back again. We have one of these days, he's coming back again. And while, help me, Lord, while I sit there in my grandmother's front yard, my little eyes were looking up toward the sky, beautiful white clouds, were crossing across the horizon. I didn't know Mama was watching me. But she came back out of the house and stood there and looked at me. She says, William, she says, are you looking for him? I said, yes, Mama, I'm looking for him. She just had a smile on her face and walked away. Here John says, he's going to come again. He's going to show up with all power. He's going to show up riding a horse with a heavenly host. And when he comes riding it's his horse with the heavenly host. There's going to be a great battle on the earth, a battle called Armageddon. God is going to do battle with the armies of the world. There's going to be thousands and millions killed. God is going to summon the birds to eat the flesh of all those who have died. But then when Jesus sets up his kingdom on this earth, when the second advent, when there's peace, and when there's power, when the, 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 the nations of the world won't be making war anymore, they're going to beat their swords into plowshares and, and, their, and, and, and their, their spears into pruning hoods. The devil at this time is going to be bound with a chain that the angels have. He's going to be locked down into a pit. He won't be able to get out. That's the reason why, brothers and sisters, you and I need to stop t listening to these folks that's running around here talking about I'm binding Satan. Nobody can bind Satan except the power of Jesus Christ himself. And he's going to bind him and put him away for a thousand years. And for that thousand years is when there's going to be peace on this earth. I want you to let you know, though, the why he's got a second advent. And when he came, which we celebrate Christmas for, he's got a second, he's got a, I'm sorry, his first advent which he came for, which we celebrate Christmas for, he's got a 
second advent that's coming where he's going to set peace on earth. But I want to introduce to you that there's a third advent that the Lord has. Oh, yes, there's a third advent that the Lord has, and this one is a request. In Mark chapter 5, we'll read the story of a, of a, of a synagogue ruler by the name of Jairus. Jairus had a daughter and a child that was sick, and she was at the point of death. But when Jairus comes to Jesus, Jairus comes to Jesus and says, Lord, uh, I come to thee. I pray thee, come. Look at what Jairus says. I pray thee, come. This isn't that what I just told you that Advent meant? Advent meant come. Jer Jairus is appealing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. I don't know about you today, but I want him to come. I want him to lay his hands on me. I need a new touch. I need some more strength. I need some more power that can only come when the Lord touches. He wants to come into our hearts. Yes, he's come born as a babe, wrapped in swaddling clothes, and laid in a manger. That's already taken place. Yes, he's going to come again when the angel dispatches from heaven and puts one foot upon dry ground and the other one upon the sea and lift his hand and blows that trumpet and says that time that was shall be no more. Yes, he's going to come. But before he comes, he's still trying to make an advent. He still wants to come. Where does he want to come? He wants to come into our hearts. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if any man hear my voice and will open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. Yes, he's still making an advent. Only this time he wants to make an advent into our hearts. He wants to make an advent into our lives. He wants to make an advent into the way that we live. But he can't come in unless we open up the door. It's a shame that there's people running to and fro in this city and across this nation right now. They're, bust, they're, they're, they're in stores. They're on the Internet. They're buying this and they're buying that. But they're not looking for the advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. And even we as, as believers, even though we've already opened up the door and allowed him into our life, sometimes our attitudes and sometimes our dispositions causes us to, to, to give him a constructive eviction. Do you know what a constructive eviction is? An constructive eviction is when somebody that's supposed to be living in a particular place can't live there because the atmosphere makes it next to impossible for them to live in peace. And sometimes our attitude and sometimes our disposition and sometimes the way that we speak to each other and sometimes the way that we treat each other makes it impossible for the Lord to live in our hearts the way that he wants to. And we evict him and he's standing on the front porch of our heart. Oh, no, he's not going nowhere because we've been bought with a price and we are, and we are not our own. He has already redeemed us, but he can't control a life. He can't live the life. He can't empower a life if he's constantly being constructively evicted because we want to have our own way. This is what Paul is writing about when he says in Ephesians 4 and 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. That's not written to unbelievers. That's not written to unsaved folk. That's not written to people who don't even believe in God. That's written to saved folk. That's written to those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. Well, the way we grieve him is when we have sin in our life, and we won't confess it, and we won't turn away from it. We want to have our own way. We want to get so caught up in what I think and what I feel and what my opinion is that we pay no attention to what God is telling us out of his word. And when we do that, we convict him. It's almost the same as him not being in our life. Well, the third thing is that I'm closing with, there ought to be an anxious anticipation of his advent. There ought to be an anxious anticipation of his advent. In other words, this anxious anticipation of his advent is actually the advent that is in reverse. Instead of him coming back to us, it means we are going to him. Paul writes to Timothy and says in 2 Timothy, verse 4 and 8, he says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but look at this, but to all them also that love his appearing. To all of them that love 
his appearing. Would you believe me if I told you that everybody is not, and I'm talking about saint folk now, not everybody is, is looking to love him for, for the coming of his appearance. You want to know why? Because some of us don't have our business fixed. Because some of us is not in order. Because some of us have got too caught up in self. Because some of us have done wrapped our hands halfway around the world and want to try to walk in the middle of the road, want to try to straddle the fence, and we're not ready for his coming. But Paul says, this righteousness, this crown of righteousness, this blessing is for all of those who love his appearance. In other words, those who are looking for him. And those who are looking for him are preparing themselves. They're constantly growing. They're constantly yielding themselves. They're, they're, they're constantly purging themselves with, through, through the confession of their sin. They're constantly growing in the Lord Jesus Christ, learning how to do battle with the devil, learning how to resist Satan, learning how to walk straight. Find themselves on the narrow road. These are the ones who are looking for him, and they prove that they're looking for him, and love his appearing because they're preparing and looking for that advent. Well, Paul fixed it for us of what this, this third one I'm talking about is going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You hear me say it all the time, where he said, And the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the trump of the archangel. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, and all of those who are alive and remain shall be called up together to meet him in the clouds. This is why I'm calling the, 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 the anxious anticipation of his advent that's in reverse. In other words, the, the first two times he's coming to earth. But the third time, he's going to stop in the middle of the air, and instead of him coming to earth, we're going to leave earth and go meet him in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I don't know about you, church, but I'm looking and I'm anxious for this third advent. I'm, look, I'm looking for this a second advent. When it has a second advent, we're going to already be gone from here. But I'm looking for that time when he's going to snatch us up out of the grave if we're gone, or snatch our old bodies up. Transform those bodies. Make him like his own glorious bodies. Make it transform and be brand new. Make it a body that will never get old and never get tired. Bodies that will never get sick and will be just like his body. John says, Beloved, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but when he, when he appears, we are going to be just like him. And I can't tell you, church, how good that makes me feel. To know that there's no more stumbling, there's a day coming, when there's no more stumbling, when there's no more babbling, when there's no more confusion, when there's no more zigzagging, when there's no more looking at people crazy, when there's no more that people looking at you crazy, when there's no more there's all this up and down, when there's no more jealousy and envy, I'm looking forward to a time, and I'm looking forward to a place where the, where the weary shall be at rest and, and, and there's no more troubling where there's no growing old, and where there's just every day is just a glad day in his presence. That's the, that's the reverse one that I'm talking about. I don't know about you this morning, but I'm looking for this other place. And in looking for this other place, that means that I and you and me and everybody else need to be busy about looking for his advent. That's one of the reasons why the church in the book of Acts, why the early church in the book of Acts, shared their belongings and had all their goods. And when we read that they, the people of the church sold their property and brought their goods and laid the money at the apostles' feet so that those among the church could have their needs met, do you know why they did that? They did that because they were looking for Jesus to return. They did that because they said, what good is this Cadillac to me? I can't drive around the golden streets of heaven. But this Cadillac isn't doing nothing to cost me money. Let me sell it and give the money to the church so that somebody can help feed the church for somebody in the church that needs some food. Let me sell this property over here that I ain't seen in 25 years. It ain't got nothing but full of weed. Let me sell it to somebody else. Maybe they can make something out of it. Let me take the money and turn it over to the church so that the church can, can feed the people and clothe the people because I'm looking for Jesus to return. When Paul writes to the church of Thessalonica, that's what he's writing them about. He's encouraging them to let them know that even though some had died before Jesus returned, the fact that they died was not going to prevent them from being with the Lord Jesus Christ. It was not going to prevent them from being together, reunited, because when the Lord appeared, not only were they going to be snatched up, but they were going to be caught up as well, and we're all going to meet the Lord in the midst of the air. I want to know that while we're in this season of Advent, while we're in this time of recognizing when he came the first time, are we preparing for the second Advent? Are we preparing 
for the second and third connection. Father in heaven, as we come this morning, we thank you so much for these few words. And hopefully, Lord, it's been as such that those listening can be encouraged, can be strengthened, and hope set. Perhaps they were feeling low. Maybe this can serve to give the Lord some new strength, as only that you can, as we look forward to the day. We don't know when the day or the hour is of, 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 of Jesus' return. He told us that no man would know the day or the hour. But, Lord, he did tell us that we ought to be watchful. He did tell us we ought to be waiting. He did tell us we ought to be alert. We, we are reminded that we need to be about our Father's business so that we don't get caught with our work undone. Thank you for these few words. And if there's anybody here today that doesn't know Jesus, and, and, and you're able to use these words to draw them before it's everlasting too late, Father in heaven, we ask you to do that, not for our sake, but for Jesus' sake. Amen. So, uh, we extend the invitation of Christian discipleship at this time, just in case there is someone that was listening that doesn't know Jesus and the part of their sin. I want you to know that, yes, as we have entered into this Christmas season, he's already come the first time. And as the scriptures identify for us, he came wrapped in swallowing clothes and laid in a manger. But when he comes the second time, he won't become wrapped in swallowing clothes. He's going to come riding a white horse wrapped in his royal robe of heaven, along with the armies of heaven. The first time he came, he laid up, he, he took off his royal robe in heaven and took off his crown and came to earth. But this time when he comes, he's going to have many crowns upon his head. He's going to have a vesture dipped in blood. And as the scripture says, upon that vesture, there's a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, because he is the Son of God. He is the Word of God. If you don't know Jesus and a part of your sin, he said, he said, behold, he says, I stand at the door and I knock. He said, if any man will open up, he said, I will come in and sup with him. He said, the day that you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Paul said, if you're willing to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. Certainly we invite you this morning to open up your heart right where you are. And just say these, whisper these words, but when you, I'm going to say some words, and I'm appealing to you to whisper these words. But if you whisper these words, don't just say them because you hear me say it. Say it out of meaning, out of your own heart. And I promise you that if you say them out of meaning, out of your own heart, our Heavenly Father, creator of heaven and earth, the one who loves you and gave his son for you, will hear and answer your prayer. Father in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I admit and I acknowledge that I have sinned and come short of your glory. But I thank you so much for your love that you sent Jesus over 2,000 years ago. I thank you that he came to this earth to save those who were lost. And Lord, while I wasn't here while he came, I acknowledge that I'm lost without him. I believe with all my heart that when he went to Calvary and shed his precious blood, when he was crucified, I believe that he died to pay for my sin debt. I believe that he was buried on Friday but three days later rose from the grave with all power in heaven and earth in his hands. I believe right now that he sits on your right hand, and one of these days, as your word says, he's coming back after his church without spot or wrinkle. Father, I want to be a part of the church, and I want to go with him when he comes. Save me now, because your word says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm calling by faith. I'm trusting by faith, just as I am. Thank you for saving me. If there's one here this morning who's listened to me, who's prayed that prayer, and you meant it or, or words similar, and you were sincere in your heart, let me tell you what, don't, what don't, don't get yourself confused. Don't think that you don't have anything because right now you don't feel anything. God is more concerned about our act of obedience than what we feel. 
God will take care of the experience and God will take care of the feeling if there ought to be any associated with it, with it in his own time and in his own way. Your job is to accept him at his word. Your job is to believe his word. Your job is to open your heart and say, yes, Lord, come in. Fix me because I can't fix myself. And I want to know that my eternal home is heaven. You let him take care of the rest. That's your part is to open up and let him in. So if there's one here this morning, then what I'm going to ask you to do as Sister Yvonne Williams, I believe it is, is scheduled to give the invitational song as she gets ready, what I'm going to ask you to do is if you have opened up your heart and you have asked the Lord to come in, I'm going to ask you to give me a call at 816-509-1247. That's 816-509-1247. I don't want you to call me right now, but I want you to call me a little bit later. Uh, to let me know this, and there's some other things I want to share with you to give you some encouragement as you start your new journey in the Lord Jesus Christ.